it's a great pleasure to welcome Alan um, to talk to us tonight. Um, Alan has, um, has worked in arthritis research and epidemiology and has been a mainstay of administration of the um, arthritis research uh, campaign now called something else and um, versus 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 arthritis, arthritis isn't it and i was thinking that i might say that he's going to going to talk um, to talk tonight on jews versus genes but um, i i thought that that would be much too corny so we we'll let him get on and tell us about uh, genetic aspects of jews okay thanks thanks very much david and and welcome everybody uh, even though you're only virtual. I'm, I'm just going to uh, share my screen. Um, so um, I'm going to um, talk um, this evening um, with the intriguing title of Do Our Genes Make Us Jewish? Lessons from um, History um, and uh, Geography. And I'll probably talk for around about 40 minutes or so. Um, and I think given the challenges of Zoom, maybe um, take your, your, your questions um, afterwards. Um, so I, I guess I, I want to start, and, and some of this is going to be um, serious, some of it relatively lighthearted. Um, but are there specific um, uh, Jewish traits? I mean, it, it's, you know, there's something very common amongst Jewish people where you have this kind of conversation. I didn't know that person was Jewish. Well, couldn't you tell that they looked Jewish? Um, and there's this issue about how good um, are we at identifying people um, who look Jewish? Now, there are a, a lots of, of, of Jewish um, facial types, but that's okay. But there are certainly, when we are out in the streets or in a shop or somewhere, we see people um, and we say that they look Jewish. Um, and um, there's um, this thing called JDAR, which is a bit like radar. Um, our ability as Jews um, to recognize um, other people who are members um, of our tribe. Um, and indeed, if you Google it, you'll get six, over six million results. But there's um, a serious side to why I introduced a talk on Jewish genetics with a picture of Barbara Streisand and a picture of typical Jews, because that implies if there is something physical that is recognizable to us, then does that tell us that behind that physical appearance, that outward physicality, there's an underpinning genetic background? And in many ways, if we have no modern molecular genetics, would our conclusion be, because people look Jewish, then there must be a collection, one or a number, of genetic variants that are associated with that particular appearance. And therefore, there is such a thing as Jewish genes. And in fact, that is what I'm going to be talking about this evening. Now, I want to go back a little bit in time and introduce you to a guy called Morris Fishberg. And Morris Fishberg was a specialist in internal medicine, a general physician um, in the Montefiore Hospital in New York um, at the turn of the 20th century. Um, and he really was very interested, um, without the advances of modern genetics, in trying to understand whether there were specific biological traits associated with being Jewish. And he, of course, was Jewish um, himself. Um, and one of the things he did 
And actually, when I show you this, you might be as shocked as I was, is he measured the shape of Jewish skulls. And in the Jewish Encyclopedia in 1906, um, he presented some data. Um, and he looked at the Catholic index, um, the uh, ratio of the, the head length to the breadth. And he noticed that most non-Jewish people, uh, their Catholic index is between 75 to 80%, but 90% of Jews have a Catholic index of more than 81.5%. And that actually in terms of this being uh, a trait, it was equally as common in Jewish men um, as in Jewish women. Now, um, having seen that paper um, and read it, I can tell you that there are many flaws. There are statistical flaws. There are flaws in the selection of people, flaws in the measurement. And although I'm not um, a, a, an expert in what happens to skull shapes, but I'm sure many of you will know that during the birth process, for example, the skull uh, shape can change for a whole bunch of reasons. So it's not necessarily um, genetic. But nevertheless, over 100 years ago, here was this Jewish physician, this Jewish geneticist, um, talking about this biological marker of being Jewish. I'm not sure that he would have ever gone down that road knowing what we learnt tragically um, three or four decades later um, in how that was used to the tremendous uh, uh, appalling disadvantage uh, by the Nazis. But the origins of the skull shape started with an attempt to show that Jewish people were biologically different from non-Jewish people. Um, and indeed, uh, Maurice Fishberg was very keen actually to show that not only were there biological differences in terms of skull shape, um, but there were um, um, other uh, differences um, which have influenced our ability to survive or not. And indeed, um, if you want, um, you can get this book um, on uh, Amazon. And I just want to um, read you some of the um, interesting things from what he said um, in his book. Um, so he said that, um, and I'm gonna come back to this, one of the great apostles of eugenics in England is inclined to the opinion that it was the intense struggle for existence that made up their greatest source of unexampled strength. That the Jew, who was a weakling or a fool, had no chance at all. The weaklings and the fools were weeded out. Intensity and strength of mind became the commonest heritage of this amazing people. And he continued, the Jews are the one human race of which we know assuredly that it has per persisted unimpaired and had been the most continuously and stringently selected of any race that can be named. In other words, his theory is that because of, and I'm gonna come back to that, because of all the disasters, natural and man-made um, that have befallen Jewish people, um, it is only the genetically strong um, that have survived. Indeed, Fishman goes on to say, Many others have propounded it before, and some have even urged ruthless persecution of the unfit as the best means of improving certain elements of humanity, thus assisting selection through survival of the fittest. He then goes on to say, when only have to consider the enormous number of financiers, merchants, manufacturers, physicians, lawyers, <coughs> musicians, artists, journalists, etc., of Jewish origin, can be convinced the number of talented, able and successful people is in excess of what would be expected. He also said, 
It is a matter of common observation that Jews are physically puny. This is Jewish genetically speaking. Jews are physically puny, a large portion of feeble, undersized, their muscular system of deficient development with narrow flat chests and of inferior capacity. Very difficult words to take on board now. But the message here is twofold that not only are there physical factors um, that distinguish us, but the traits that exist today that goes with the genetic background we have are shaped in some ways by what's happened to um, our race over the generations. Um, and I guess Fisher's overbearing narrative is that we're not a pure race, that actually the reason we have, the, and this, I'm interpreting here, the genes that we have, own more to our history uh, and our environment and culture than to genes. And this is something that I'm going to come back to. In other words, do we have, and I haven't given you the data to show that yet, but on the assumption I'm going to show you some data that Jewish people have different genetic backgrounds to non-Jews, is it because of something that happened in, in magically in, in when we arrived on a planet, or is it because of various aspects of history, environment, and culture? And I hope I'm going to prove to you um, that it's the latter. Um, but of course, we we um, we have these these um, kind of stories. Jews are the the smartest race in the world and superior humans that some people um, uh, claim. And that, you know, there have been 129 Nobel Prize winners. I shut there's been a few more since I produced this slide. Um, but of course, this has nothing to do um, with race or ethnicity. Um, and indeed, a wonderful book, if you've not read, if you've not read it, I can really recommend it uh, by um, David Wright who says that human racial classification is of no social value and is positively destructive of social and human relations. So, I mean, maybe we can have a discussion about it. I, I think, you know, I was, I was chatting to somebody at a concert when we were allowed to go to concerts and I was discussing my interest in Jewish genetics and this lady which was Jewish got really quite angry. She said, why are you doing it? Why, what is the value um, in showing that there may be genetic differences uh, between Jews um, and non-Jews, given the problems that that can cause? And actually, I, I, I don't um, disagree with that um, as a concern. Um, I guess um, I would argue that it, it has two goals. One is perhaps it gives us insights into certain um, areas of, of disease in, in medicine. And the other thing is perhaps understanding our, our history um, and, and geography. Um, and I, I hope I'm not gonna disappoint uh, any of you or, or see a, a mad rush to the, the, the Zoom exit screens. I'm only going to refer tangentially um, to Jewish genetic diseases such as Tay-Sachs. I'm not an expert in that. I'm sure there are many people in the audience uh, tonight um, who are. And my main focus is going to be on the second question. But I think in addition to these discussions about physical appearance, these inane discussions about whether Jews are brighter or not brighter or worse at sport or better musician or what have you. One of the conclusions about looking at diseases such as Tay-Sachs is that now we know the genetic origin of Tay-Sachs, then that is telling us something perhaps about um, specific genes that are, are carried by uh, Jewish people um, that um, 
increased disease susceptibility. And Tay-Sachs um, is only one of a large number of relatively rare, predominantly um, recessive disorders, some of which are particular for Ashkenazi Jews, some of which are particular for Sephardi uh, Jews, like G6PD deficiency, and some of which, interestingly, are common to Jews who are both Ashkenazi um, and um, um, Sephardi. Um, and I guess I don't need to tell um, this audience that in with these kind of, of, of rare diseases that you would need to have uh, a mating between a, a carrier father and a carrier mother. And although 50% of the offspring of those matings would be carriers, just one in four um, would carry um, the disease. Uh, and as I said, there are now, if you look at the Sarnoff Center for Jewish Genetics, 75 disorders um, uh, being identified of which have been um, recessive. Uh, and here is um, a list of them, including things like Gaucher's disease and a whole range of other conditions. But of course, the fact that a disease is more frequent uh, doesn't mean it is a Jewish disease. It probably means that Jewish people, for the reasons that I'm going to talk about, are more likely to inherit the disease genes. And there are also some very um, common complex disorders with an increased risk in Jews. Again, I'm sure you all know much more about it than I do, and I won't be discussing it, but it's interesting that the BRCA1, the BRCA2 mutations, which are so sadly associated with breast and ovarian cancer, the carriage rate is much higher amongst Ashkenazi Jews um, than in the general population. So here we are, interested if you are, in looking at the specific genetic background of Jewish people and wondering whether it's different, that prior to if you like, our lifetime, what did we know? There were certainly aspects of physical appearance. What did they mean? There were certain measurements, skull shape. What did they mean? There were certain um, uh, behavioral attributes. What did they mean? And the only thing that we had to suggest a real relationship with a true genetic origin was um, diseases. Um, now, diseases are one thing, are there other genetic markers? Were there, for example, blood group differences? Well, possibly um, a, a few. But really the understanding of whether there were genetic differences between Jewish people and non-Jewish people um, needed to um, re, uh, we uh, wait until we had a greater un understanding um, of um, genetics and the structure of, 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 of DNA. Um, and indeed, it was only really with the understanding of the double helical structure uh, by, by DNA, by, uh, by Crick and Watson, that we've been able to make uh, progress. And isn't it fascinating how these two giants of their time that um, Francis Quick, Crick, um, his name is memorialized in the Crick Institute in London, the beacon of biomedical research in the UK. And James Watson is appropriately vilified um, for probably his racist and eugenic um, um, attitudes. Um, but, once we had the tool of DNA and understanding about human variation, we could begin to look more at what was happening in, in Jews. And we didn't need markers like a physical appearance, a skull shape. We didn't even need 
a marker like tracking a disease through a population, we could, with the modern molecular genetics, identify mutations in sequences of genes which didn't need to have any biological, physical, or physiological correlate to be able to understand uh, these differences. And indeed, if I have time um, at the end of this talk, I, I want to give you a very, very interesting story based on the understanding that the mutations that happen all the time to us, and we've all heard about mutations in the COVID-19 virus, the, 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 un, the, the okay ones and the unokay ones, but, and very interesting to see how COVID-19 really did not mutate for many, many months and only recently started to do so. But in humans generally, without any obvious survival advantage, mutations occur at a constant rate over time, which has allowed population geneticists to identify when in history a particular mutation um, occurred. But we, 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 in order to understand that, because these things had no obvious effect and we didn't have the technology, until in the 1990s, um, it was known that for when we, the genes that we have comprise long, long sequences um, of, of nucleotides. And these nucleotides, as I'm sure you all know, you can be A, T, C, O, G, and there can be um, a number of uh, mutations in these. And for many of, the, many of these genes, there is a what's called a single nucleotide uh, polymorphism, um, SNP, sometimes referred to as, as SNPs. And um, each of us perhaps have four to five million. And the reason why that is so exciting is that we have um, the genetic technology now to be able to sequence the genome and understand, I mean, and, and, and sequence people for hundreds of thousands um, or in, indeed millions uh, of these SMPs. So individuals um, can be um, characterized. And indeed it is that technology which has enabled um, the, the group at the Sanger um, over the last few months be the world leaders at understanding uh, the different uh, genomes uh, in the COVID uh, virus. So with these tools, with these detailed, if you like, SNP maps, we've been able to look at how close or how different are Jews from non-Jews without needing these markers like disease, like physical appearance, um, um, et cetera. So then that leads to the question, accepting the challenge that was put to me, as I told you by um, my, my uh, audience member about why study it, but you know, having looked at it, the issue is how different are Jews from non-Jews and why are we different? So let's, before coming on to the differences, I just want to briefly ask why we might have different genetic backgrounds to non-Jews. Now, the first thing to say is, and I hope I don't upset um, anybody um, in the audience um, who believes strictly in, in the uh, the first X chapters in, in Bereshit, um, that there were probably no Jews in, in, um, in prehistoric times. Um, and, and indeed, um, we know that actually there's a little bit of Neanderthal um, DNA um, um, in, in all of us. And there's an, an interesting debate um, as to whether um, mon modern uh, Homeo sapiens is actually somebody who's evolved from um, other uh, homo species um, or what's happened. And, you know, there's a whole um, area 
of, if you like, paleopathology and genetics looking into that. But in general terms, my starting thesis was that man as recognizable as Homo sapiens um, had not differentiated into different religious groups and therefore um, we all started um, with the same genome. So why, my, why we have different genetic backgrounds, um, I'm going to cover a number of these issues. Um, and the first interesting thing is what geneticists call endogamy. Um, our um, tradition of marrying um, within um, the group. Now, why do Jews marry within groups? Because you want to marry somebody who shares your religious observance. Um, it may be somebody who shares your cultural um, way of living. The opportunity in some populations that they were the only people who you met. And also or, or the, the bias works in, in bidirectionally that um, people did not want their sons or daughters to marry people who were non-Jewish. So the consequence of endogamy practiced at a very high rate within Jewish people over the generations is to concentrate um, the, uh, perhaps a relatively small number um, of genes um, within um, the group. And of course, um, what's interesting is endogamy in, within Jewish people is on the decline. Um, I'm a, a baby boomer um, and only 18% of us um, had intermarried parents. Um, you come to the millennial generation, um, it's much higher. So this concept of if you're interested in looking at the genetics of being Jewish, it's going to become more difficult given what's happening in um, society. Um, just to say, um, this is some work done in the United States. The thick blue line um, is, is Jews looking at um, uh, endogamy. Um, and the numbers on the y-axis, if you like, that's 10 million, 10,000. So these are the likelihood, the increased likelihood of you marrying within your racial group compared to not. So in, you know, 1920, you are thousands of times more likely to marry within your ethnic group um, and um, compared, and now um, it's going down to about 70 or 80 and, and it's declining um, um, in all races. Interestingly, the decline is not so substantial um, in the uh, black American population. So that's the, the, the first thing. Now, the second reason why Jewish people uh, may have um, different genes over generations is the survival advantage. Um, now, I, I don't know how many of you know the, the lactose um, uh, intolerance um, story. Um, the, one of the theories goes that when man uh, first landed um, on the planet, um, we weren't designed to be able to consume milk. Uh, we weren't domesticating uh, animals. We were just supposed to eat vegetar vegetables and, and meat. Um, um, and when the first humans started uh, digesting milk, uh, it didn't kill them, um, but they were pretty lactose intolerant and it was fairly unpleasant consequences. But there were a few um, who um, had a genetic mutation that allowed them to be tolerant for lactose. And of course, that then became a more helpful um, genotype, and as a consequence, over time, uh, it became a more predominant genotype and a more predominant phenotype. Being able to uh, digest milk was associated with a survival um, advantage. So I'm not saying that Jews have less lactose intolerance, but just pointing out that 
one of the, the arguments that uh, this guy that I'd referred to before, uh, Caleb Celebi had said, well, actually, you know, um, Jews have had, Jews survived for so many thousands of years, famine, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore the genes that they have have coded uh, uh, for survival and have concentrated um, uh, these genes. I mean, it's quite interesting actually, um, for very complicated reasons, um, Jewish people probably have a higher life expectancy um, than non-Jews um, and uh, Israel also currently has one of the highest rates of life expectancy in the world. Um, the third reason um, why genes should differ in Jewish populations um, is the phenomenon known as, as, as bottlenecking. Um, so if you can um, imagine that over time we're living in relatively uh, confined uh, 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 populations, um, maybe with a, a high um, level of mutations, but actually for maybe there's um, a pogrom or something like that, or a famine, an attack. So a relatively small number um, survive. And those that do survive um, then multiply more. So you started with a large, quite a diverse population through a combination of natural and man-made disasters, a relatively small number of people who have wanted to maintain their culture, but the, reduce the gene pool, and then that gene pool um, um, expanded. And that's one of the um, explanations um, for why particularly um, Ashkenazi um, uh, Jews have a relatively small number of concentrated genes. So it leads to change in the gene pool caused by a small population uh, migrating uh, to a, a new area. And that, for example, is one of the reasons why um, Jews have, um, Ashkenazi Jews have more Tay-Sachs um, because of this um, uh, phenomenon um, of, um, of, of, of bottlenecking. Um, and indeed, Indeed, uh, and I probably won't have time to talk about it. Maybe that will be a uh, subject for an, another talk if you want to invite me back. Is that actually the feeling is that Ashkenazi Jews descended from a very, very tiny number of, of founder individuals, if you like. And indeed, compared probably to any other ethnic group, racial group, if you like on the planet, the rate of expansion of Ashkenazi Jewry, okay, well, at least until the time of the Holocaust, was phenomenal. That we have almost a unique experiment in history where a relatively small group of people had a mass expansion over three or 400 years from a narrow, genetically narrow base to a much larger population. And interestingly, um, that's not true about um, Sephardi Jews. Um, why should Jews differ in Jewish population? Well, um, there's the, the story about um, uh, conversions. Um, the kind of great belief that maybe, um, you know, we, we all started off as being Jews and therefore people fell off along the way uh, and we weren't actually bringing in in new people and actually uh, historically from what I gather maybe some people in the audience know more than I do um, and that's not true um, there's this um, a wonderful story uh, about uh, the um, in, in Kazaria about um, the conversion there of, of millions um, and the story goes that they did, didn't know what religion they should be. Um, by the time they were, came to reach the decision, whatever, a few hundred in, in AD, they had the option of being Christian, being Muslim or being Jewish. And the story goes that there was this beauty parade 
of the three religions. Um, and the leader said to them, said, okay, what's your first choice? Uh, and what's your, um, it's, uh, so he said to the, the people giving the, the beautiful, religion, if you weren't doing what you were doing, what would you be? And the Muslim guy said, well, if I'm a Muslim, I'd be Jewish. And the Christian guy said, well, if I wasn't Christian, I'd be Jewish. So the guy said, well, okay, it's obvious we should be Jewish. So one of the theories of Ashkenazi Judaism um, is a mass uh, migration um, from Kazaria. I think what does seem to be the case that in Greco-Roman times, there was a mass conversion to Judaism. Um, and at the peak of the Roman Empire, maybe there were about 6 million or 10% um, of the, the population of the Roman Empire were Jews. Um, and they migrated from Palestine uh, to Greek and, and the Roman Empire um, and, and then to Europe. And indeed, um, there are very, very specific, um, uh, if I've got time, may come on to it, um, SMP polymorphism sequences that you can associate with kind of ancient Greek and ancient Roman um, influences. And I think there is no doubt that a lot of European Jewry today carry some of that genetic background um, from those um, uh, conversions. Um, and um, so with that as background, um, I want to refer you to uh, an article that's now 10 years old, that's saying, well, okay, what do we know? What do we know about whether Jews have different genetic backgrounds um, to non-Jews? Given everything that I said, all the things that could have um, influenced us, what do we know? So they took a number of Jewish groups, Iranians, um, uh, um, the Iranian Jews, the Persian Jews, if you like, the Iraqi, the Babylonian Jews, Syrian Jews, Italian, the Roman and Greek Jews, the Turkish Jews, and the European Ashkenazi. And they compared them um, with a number of other American groups, African Americans, um, uh, East Asian, Orientals, if you will, South Asians, Indians, um, and if you will, Mexicans, and non-Jewish European groups. Um, and, and this is what they found. Now, without going into details about what this plot shows, but this is looking at a number of these genetic markers and actually showing that they do, Jewish people cluster quite differently from non-Jewish people um, and that there are differences between people who have one Jewish parent, one Jewish grandparent, uh, and I, I can't remember what an almost Jew is. Maybe somebody that was like gefilte fish. Um, what's interesting, though, is also the difference or the similarity uh, between Jewish people and other groups. And as you can see, when you look at North Africans, Europeans, and non-Jewish populations in Israel, there's a very close Jewish sim similarity genetically, very, very different from South and Central Africa, and very, very different from Southeast Asia and South uh, America. Um, and if we pull that apart a bit, we see some of the other differences um, between Jewish groups. So all those in red are different Jewish populations. All those who are in paler colors are not. So what do we see here? We see we've got Iranian Jews, different genetically from Iraqi, from Babylonian Jews, different from Syrian Jews, different from Ashkenazi Jews, different from Greek and Turkish Jews, and different from Italian Jews. But we see Iranian Jews are similar to Palestinians. We see Ashkenazi Jews similar to North Italian and French and Basque non-Jews. 
we see Iraqi and Syrian Jews, similar to the Druze and the Bedouin, um, and the um, uh, uh, Italian uh, Jews, not far removed from the Sardinian Jews. So I think I've showed you that there are genetic differences between Jewish people and non-Jewish people. And I think I've shown you some of the reasons why. Um, and in the last, um, have I got a few more minutes, David? So in, in the last few minutes, I just want to change tack <coughs> and tell you a very, very interesting story that came out of studies of Jewish genetics. And I want to talk to you about being a Jewish dad. Everybody talks about being a Jewish mum. I want to talk to you about being a Jewish dad. Now, the thing about men differing from women chromosomally, as you all know, is you have a Y chromosome. Um, and therefore, we can be pretty certain that our Y chromosomal DNA must have come from our fathers, because our mothers don't have Y chromosome, and that must have come from his father, and from his father, and his father. So by looking at Y chromosomes, we can really understand something about the passage of genes across the generation. Now, indeed, there's always been this interesting thing, and I don't want to get, or maybe you do want to get into a theological debate um, about patrilineal versus matrilineal um, descent. Um, who was your dad? Do we know who your father was? Um, but there is an interesting genetic issue for being able to look um, at um, your father. I'm just going to move on a bit. And of course, the really interesting group are the Kohenim. Now, it may be that they're called Kohen. It may be you have a name that was Kohen, like Katz, for example, um, but Kohen, Kohan, Kagan, etc. Um, and what we know about Kohenim is that if you are a practicing Kohen, then your father will have been a Kohen and his father. Now, okay, maybe some have fallen down along the route, but Kohenim who today say, I am a Kohen uh, and I'm prepared to get involved in priestly blessings and all the rest of it, you could be able to trace my Y chromosome uh, back through generations. And indeed, this is what geneticists have done. This is the perfect group for looking at long-term transmission of a purebred group, because there'll be very few people who are Cohen today who cannot trace their Cohen stock back. And indeed, there are um, Q, um, Cohen mutations. Um, there is one called the AL, ALU, um, additional bit um, of DNA, which is found in normal Y chromosome. Um, there's a number of variants. Um, and indeed, um, what we see um, is that this particular variant is very common in Ashkenazi and Sephardi Jews, but not in Kohenim. So here we've got a mutation that is less common in Kohenim than regular Jews. Um, and there are a whole range of other Y chromosome uh, markers which are different between Kohenim and non Kohenim, but not different between Ashkenazi and Sephardi Kohens compared to non um, compared to Ashkenazi and Sephardi. So this is a Kohen gene, not an Ashkenazi one, not a Sephardi one, or not um, a, a Jewish one. So this might tell us something, interestingly, about the common origin of Sephardi and Ashkenazi Kohenim. They may wear different hats, but they've, they've got the same genetic background. Now, going back to something I said at the beginning, 
that given that mutations in humans probably occur at a constant rate over time, and how close and how far apart mutations are can give an indication of when they first occurred. So these Cohen mutations, well, when did they occur? Well, they probably occurred around about 3,000 years ago. And when was Aaron thought to have been around? About 3,000 years ago. So could be a nice story, but maybe the first Cohen haplotype occurred around about the time we believe that, that Aaron was, was uh, doing his, his, his job as the um, supportive brother to, uh, to Moses. Now, one of the interesting things is that um, not all Cohen's um, uh, have this sequence and seen in many other populations. So we can look at this Cohen sequence um, and you, of course, um, you know, you're not gonna say to a man who's pregnant and you're not going to say to a woman who is pregnant that she isn't. So we do have false positives and false negatives. So these Cohen genes, not all Cohen's have them for sure. And there's certainly some Middle Eastern populations, particularly in the Gulf states, where they have these. Um, but, um, and the Azumanis um, and Kurds, for example. And these, as I say, these Cohen genes have seen number of, of populations. Um, but then the most interesting study on this was done again about 10 years ago, which looked at number of Cohen's, a number of Levium, Levites, Israelites, ordinary Jews, and a whole range of normal Jews. Um, and they found, as I've said before, um, that these Cohen's um, had this a different Jack gene, particularly gene, uh, much more than Levium and Israelites, but, but the Yemenites and Jordanians had it. And then they did something very smart. What they did is they said, look, there's a number of these very complicated genes in this Y chromosome. What about people having a whole sequence? And we know that genes close together can be inherited as a sequence. And some of you may know this expression haplotype, which just means a bunch of genes inherited um, together. And so they looked at what they believed to be was a haplotype of <coughs> all these different Cohen genes occurring together. And this is what they found. That this haplotype did not exist pretty well in any other population, Jewish or non-Jewish, compared to its high frequency in, in Kohenim. Um, I have to say, I thought that was um, fascinating. Um, and it, it, it's where actually I'm, I'm going to um, uh, end um, this story. So I've taken you um, on a journey, maybe started off with Barbara Streisand, gone back to the beginning of the 20th century, and possibly now back to the beginning of time. And I think all of this has probably told us a little bit about who we are and where we've come from. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ellen. That's a, a very interesting story, which um, where there, there are questions that are relevant to bits and pieces of it, which, um, which have already been put through onto the internet. So um, I'm gonna start off firing, firing away one, coming straight out of that. Um, <clears throat> apart from pointing out that um, there's another explanation of the name Katz, of course, is that it was your great-great-grandmother's name, not your great-great-grandfather's name, because the marriage wasn't registered. Oh, right. Uh, so I don't, ha I don't have the gene. <laughs> the, um, the, um, the, um, the, the one question is that, of course, um, Koenim are supposed to be part of the tribe of Levi. And yet the striking thing in the days of Yushio and as Michael Baum pointed out, is that the Levium do not have the Koenim gene. None of them have it. Is that, 
What's the explanation for that, do you think? Gosh, um, it's difficult. I, I, I mean, I, I'm not a sufficient biblical um, scholar um, to know that. I mean, maybe um, there was something um, in the way that Kohanim um, kept the faith more, were, were more treasured. I, I mean, I... I, I, I mean, the, the, the other alternative is that it's, is that it's, it's a, it, it was effectively a bottleneck effect. Well, well we've got somebody it, here. I've got Alan Rubin said he's got, he's going to give us an explanation. So. Yes. Okay. Can he, Alan, can you unmute? I can't, I can't unmute him. He, he can, um, uh, he, he can have to put it on. He, he can put it onto the chat. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's not question number one. There are questions about, about, um, the questions about the implications of this. Um, there's a question about Ashkenazim. Is there any evidence that Ashkenazim respond differently to different kinds of medication? Have any of these been mapped to MAC to, MAC to pharmacogenomics in any kind of way? Um, and the answer is, um, I don't know. Um, I mean, I do know that, for example, there are um, pharmacogenomic differences with several groups. Um, both in, uh, in uh, uh, the North American populations, American Blacks um, often be, uh, respond very differently, sometimes tragically to um, uh, drugs like uh, hydralazine. Um, Japanese um, respond differently to some drugs, um, methotrexate, which many people will know is used in treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. Japanese can only tolerate um, very, very tiny doses. I'm not aware um, of, of um, any Ashkenazi differences, I have to say. And there are two, there are um, founder, uh, you know, uh, founder gene effects and, 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 uh, and selective advantages that great people have raised. <clears throat> so I'm gonna give you the first one, which is, um, which is the one of course, um, because it's a rheumatological one to a certain extent, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Um, uh, with is that a Ashkenazi Jewish disease? Is it biased in that way? And is there any anything known about the advantage that um, the advantage that that one might convey? Well, um, so I mean, um, well, uh, Ellis Danlos is a, um, a difficult problem because actually people um, call a number of different phenotypes um, Ellis Danlos. Yep. Um, and what we might call benign joint hypermobility now is called Ellis Danlos type two or what have you. Um, and um, whether um, it's associated with potentially the ability to hurdle better or something like that. I mean, one of the problems is um, a lot of these conditions are associated with musculoskeletal injury. And of course, diseases like Marfan's can be associated with, with vascular injury and, and, and bleeding. Um, I mean, interesting as, as a general point, I, I think, and maybe I, I wasn't clear enough in the talk, we could try, away, try and get away from thinking about Jewish diseases. I, I, I suspect there aren't Jewish diseases. I think there are conditions for the reasons that I was trying to get over in, in the talk, uh, being with, that we've been concentrating um, within our genome specific traits, carrier traits, if you will, um, that have seemingly made these conditions uh, um, more common. But I mean, in terms of Ellis Danlos type syndrome, I don't think that's particularly um, as strong. Uh, I mean, it's an inter inter interesting point because um, um, when I took Mark Walpole to Israel, um, he, he, he was at great pains to explained to people that there weren't Jewish genetic diseases exactly as you said. He, he had this view that there were diseases that were more common amongst Jews and that it was actually quite dangerous to refer yeah. to it the, 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 the other way. Um, the, the, um, the, 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 other, the other one that, that, that um, the, the other one, there is the question of the advantage that some of these mutations convey. And one of the other ones was Victor Hoffrand raised the question of the select advantage of the Gaussian mutation that um, um, where bottlenecks unlikely because there are other genes in the same family that of, of enzymes. Is there, is there any anything known about the selective advantage of that? Um, um, the, the answer is, and um, there may be. I, I, I'm afraid I, 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 I don't know. I mean, I, I think. Um, I mean, going back 
to the 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 broader issue. I'm sorry, I can't answer the Gatch's question. Um, but the 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 broader issue of um, selective uh, advantage. I, I mean, I think it is fascinating that I mean, um, as um, a, a race, um, we over history we have been subject to an enormous amount of of, of, of survival pressures. Um, and it is not unreasonable to postulate that, you know, being able to survive the poverty uh, uh, um, and the, the constant relocation, et cetera, et cetera, um, uh, has been associated uh, with survival um, advantage. But I mean, that's a general point and not the specific thing about the Gauchy's gene, which I don't know about. I mean, the two questions that have come up, one is, one is, one is about blood group, blood group A and more susceptibility to COVID. And the other is the question about the, uh, whether there's any um, genetic, um, genetic issue in relationship to COVID-19. And is, is, has anything been, been um, anything sensible being said about that? that uh, um, I, well, I think it, it's actually been, uh, firstly, I mean, I don't think I'm saying anything that, that, that um, uh, nobody knows. I mean, in general, um, there's relatively little um, that's been shown genetically in terms of susceptibility to COVID-19. Um, there is a, um, um, a mutation carried by a, a large number of people in Singapore um, that seems to protect them against um, um, developing clinical disease. So, um, and the, 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 the thought is that there, um, there is a genetic mutation there. There are some evidence that parts of the uh, consequences, particularly the more adverse consequences of COVID-19 have things in common with um, autoimmunity. And there's been some HLA associations associated with severe uh, COVID. Um, I mean, I think in broad terms, there's been an enormous amount of work looking at population genetics and um, not so much susceptibility to COVID, but if, if you get it, who's going to do badly um, without much concrete apart from those, those, those uh, two examples that I've said. Mm. And so the first part of your question, David, was... No, 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 no that, 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 that was really the, the, the question okay. surrounding COVID. COVID COVID nineteen. I mean, there 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 is um there are there have been suggestions also that 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 um that, um, that in fact the um, the familial Mediterranean fever um, mutations have been have have, have, have been an, an an advantage. Yeah. Um, in, in the same in, in the same kind of way. Yeah, and, and of course it's interesting because I mean, is FMF a, a, a Jewish disease? Well, it, it certainly, uh, it, well, it's certainly a disease where there's a very, very strong uh, genetic basis, but of course it, it is not unique to Jews. And I suspect um, it, it's because of the, the, the geographical uh, and <laughs> historical background. Um, causes. I mean, the answer about Jews and COVID, I think as everybody knows, I mean, it's, you know, we only need to see What's happening in Stamford Hill, or you know that that funeral in Israel last week, to understand why 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 COVID is, is spreading so much in that population? You you could argue that you genetically predispose some people are genetically predisposed to go to funerals, of course. It could be, which yeah. is which is <laughs> or, or, or to or to large or to large weddings. Yeah. And the 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 um, I mean one of one of the one of the interesting one of the interesting things that. That, um, that comes out is the is the is the um, migrate is the migration theory, um, the, the, the migration theory, um, is the is the, the is there any pattern in the genes between you mentioned partly that there were difference between Iraq and Iran, is there any any evidence of that difference reflected genetically at all? Oh yes, um, and it's very interesting. Um, and um, so I, I didn't really have time to go into um, the, the details of the genetic basis of, of different groups. And actually, if, 
this association would like. There's, there's another talk that I do on, on that about the different populations. Um, and um, just, I can't remember which way round it is, but it's something like um, the um, Iranian Jews are closer to Sephardi Jews than they are to Iraqi Jews in their genetic relationship. Um, and certainly there are very distinct, um, if you like, uh, Roman Jewish um, uh, genes as well as Greek Jewish genes as well. Right, right. So there's a, so in other words, there's, they, they, although one refers to the 600, 700 year old bottleneck, nonetheless, there are these other. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that the, 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 the bottleneck is predominantly in the kind of middle European Ashkenazi Jews. That, that, that's where the bottleneck occurred. It certainly didn't occur in the Sephardi Jews. There, there are, I mean, there, you know, there may be a relatively small number of Ashkenazi founders. That's certainly not true in, in, in Sephardi. And in fact, some of the more interesting Jewish genetics has come from the detailed examination of different Sephardi populations, uh, both in, in, uh, in the Americas, uh, as well as in, in Spain and Portugal. Well, I think we've, um, on a, uh, we, we've not got to go home out, out into the cold, but nonetheless, I think we're going to, we're going to release you because thank you for really a very interesting and thought provoking talk. Um, some people have asked for um, ideas about reading more about the subject and actually um, maybe you can send Hillary some. Yeah, um, I will do. Yeah, some, so there's a couple some, of books that I can recommend. Some, in, some information that you can recommend um, and uh, much appreciated. And, um, and uh, we're, we're trying to arrange for uh, further discussion as you suggested. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thanks everybody. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, one thing. Sorry, I forgot one thing. Um, for everybody who isn't seeing Alan Rubin's explanation, Alan Rubin puts out that Kwanim have tended to really marry in much, much more assiduously and carefully than other groups of Jews. Yeah. That may be why the tray has been preserved. But more than the being. Okay, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And I've learned something about your great grandmother tonight. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much.